This is a algebra's category theory process theory session, and we'll start with Robert, who will talk to us about some no-go results in quantum domain theory. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is the title. Like, if you, if I were more optimistic, it would be something like two related results in quantum domain theory, um, which, uh, but uh, this is the title I chose in the end. Right, and so I'll give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. So um, in the first section of the talk, I'm just going to go over d domain theory in five minutes. And then the second part uh, is about finite dimensional quantum programs and the, the, the first result uh, on that. And the third part is to do with infinite dimensional quantum programs as interpreted through C-star algebras. OK, so what is domain theory? So, um, in mathematics, <coughs> you have functions that are defined by uh, symbols, uh, algebraically, such as what I've written here. And then, uh, when you interpret them, you put arguments in which come from the domain, which in this case is the, the real numbers uh, squared without the origin, you know, the, the plane without the origin. Um, how, how can we do that? So the question that domain theory asks is how can we do this for um, expressions in programming languages? So here I've written some from Lambda Calculus, um, and I've kind of deliberately written them with some that have free variables, some have bound variables, and so on. But the idea is that something like x should define a function, and something like lambda x dot x is also a function. And, uh, a fu but a function on what uh, is, the, is the question. So what's the domain? of these uh, functions, and uh, what thing do the variables vary over? Uh, because uh, in these kinds of uh, things, it, languages, it isn't time. They don't vary over time. They vary over like, different possible arguments. And so kind of the answer is it's uh, something called DCPO, and the type of functions you use are so-called Scott continuous functions. Um, but before I kind of give the definition, I'll give an example application of how you use this which makes it clearer and explains why. So the example application is defining recursive functions. So uh, here I've defined a function to take the length of a list. So the length of the empty list is zero. The length of a non-empty list is the length of its tail plus one. And so since length is defined in terms of length, this is recursive. So how do we, uh, def what do we, how do we define recursion, you know, uh, since it's defined in terms of itself? Well, the first thing we do is we modify the function a little bit. So it now takes a function as an argument. So we sort of cut the, cut the loop that we've uh, made by having the function call itself. And so instead it calls another function, which I've called f here, uh, instead of recursing. So what we need to do is solve an equation. So we know that the, this function at the top, the taking the length of a list, satisfies this equation. If you put... <laughs> If you put it in 4f, then in the bottom uh, section, then you get exactly the top section. So we need to solve, uh, solve we t we've turned uh, a problem about you know, recursion into a problem about solving an equation. And then how do we solve the equation? By iteration, which is a very common way to uh, not only solve equations numerically, but prove they exist, um, prove solutions exist abstractly. Uh, so how, how do we do the iteration? So um, since the, uh, this thing f on the previous slide is a function, we, have the, uh, we start with a completely undefined partial function. So in fact, we use partial functions throughout because we can't be sure that a recursion will actually give us a total function. Uh, it's always something we have to prove rather than something that will just always happen. So for the, the zeroth order approximation, you just take f to be this undefi totally undefined function, which you uh, represent with that symbol, um, and then uh, put, put it in. So we now have a function that successfully takes the length of a, an empty list as zero, because it doesn't do a recursive call. And then the, uh, when you take the length of a list that's not empty, it tries to evaluate this undefined function and then gets, uh, gets back nothing, because it can't be defined. So we've made a small bit of progress. Um, in that it works for the empty list. Uh, but then we can 
do the actual iteration step. So the n plus oneth order approximation uh, is, is obtained by putting the, uh, n, the nth order approximation in for the function, uh, like I'm showing in this equation. And so, for instance, the first order approximation, we, it now works, well, it still works for um, the empty list as it did before. It also works for a list of length one um, because it becomes the zeroth order approximation, which worked for an empty list and is applied to an empty list. And then now it just doesn't work for lists longer than length one. And so we we've, uh, create a kind of order on partial functions in terms of how defined they are and if they extend the, de the domain of definition of each other. And in this, uh, in this partial order on partial functions, we get uh, a monotone increasing sequence of approximations. And then we take it to the limit. So we, uh, what, what this symbol means is we take the, the least upper bound or the joint, uh, the, the, you know, the smallest element that's an upper bound for everything. Uh, and then it turns out that uh, once we've set everything up right, this does give us a total function, and it does solve the uh, equation we had at the beginning, and it does define this recursive function uh, as it should have. Okay, so what, since I did that without defining domains, now let's define domains. So uh, DCPO is uh, a partially ordered set, and then we were, before we used uh, monotone sequences, but uh, in general we have to use monotone nets, and it's just for mathematical convenience. But um, so it's it's partially ordered, and then all uh, monotone nets have least upper bounds, so we can do that iteration step. Uh, you know, we can take it to the limit, and then. The morphisms, so these form a category, and the morphisms uh, have to preserve this structure. So they have to be order preserving, and they have to preserve, yeah. and they have to preserve least upper bounds uh, of monotone nets. And uh, the name for that is uh, Scott continuous, uh, named after Dana Scott, who uh, kind of invented this field, or one of the co-inventors of this field. Um, and then. We represent a part of a program, or even a whole program, as a Scott continuous function uh, between DCPOs with a bottom element. And, uh, and that's kind of the most basic setup for something that could be called domain theory. Um, and they've, they form a, they, you have function spaces, so you, they are a Cartesian closed category. And um, the kind of iteration step I showed, and that it solves the equation, you can prove uh, using a, a, a fixed point theorem that this does actually uh, always solve the equation, although it might not give you what you actually want every time. Uh, and then often you have to add other requirements, and then various names for them, which I, I don't have time to explain, are um, being uh, continuous, you know, we have a continuous DCPO, and that's actually the most usual thing being called a domain, or an algebraic DCPO, or a bifinite DCPO. There are these. Uh, different notions. The only one that's going to come up later is continuous. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to uh, define that. All right, so how does that, which was all classical, relate to quantum programming languages? So uh, density matrices, they have a well-known partial order on them, the uh, Leuven order, um, where the, you know, a positive matrix is positive, and then if you want to compare two matrices, you uh, take the difference, and if the difference is positive, then one of them is less than the other. Uh, and then this uh, cone is not a DCPO because it doesn't, um, you do have sequences that have no upper bounds to them, but it's, uh, it's a kind of a bounded DCPO like the positive real numbers are, in that if you have an upper bound, then you do have a least upper bound. And uh, therefore, if you have density matrices of trace less than or equal to one, uh, then this does form a DCPO, and it's a continuous DCPO. And the, uh, the set of uh, super operators, which are, for this purpose, completely positive trace non-increasing maps, um, uh, are always uh, Scott continuous, so that never has to actually be assumed as an extra step. And they also form a continuous DCPO. And this was actually proved by uh, Peter Selinger in uh, his paper, uh, QPL, in 2004. Uh, so if you want to go back and look at that, uh, that's where you'll find it. 
And then in the other paper for the same year, he kind of used this uh, domain structure to define uh, recursive functions and uh, also loops in uh, the programming language uh, in, in, the, in that paper from that year. Okay, so here's now a, an attempted example. So, uh, and I say it's attempted because it's, uh, it's going to fail if I give it away, but um, so uh, what's something we, we like to approximate, or we need to approximate rather? Uh, so we can't um, use all, just take all the unit trees um, as our gate set, because uh, there are uncountably many of them, and uh, kind of we, we can only do uh, countably many things. Uh, and you know the language we use to describe things is countable, uh, not un not uncountable. So we can't just write down an arbitrary unit tree and and start using it, uh, or have them all just be there in our language. Um, so what we do, is, as everyone knows, is we uh, we just we take a universal set of gates like Clifford plus T, and then we approximate the unit. We you know we show that this approximates uh, unit trees to an arbitrarily good uh, degree of accuracy. Uh, and we have the you know we have the Solovey QTF theorem, and you know we also have that if you have Clifford without T, then you can't do this because uh, you don't have enough unit trees that way. So the question to then ask is, you know, can we have a domain theoretic semantics like this, um, where this kind of approximation is defined, you know, by a program, and um, uh, and we approximate from below in the Lerner order, uh, uh, and then if you kind of mathematicize that uh, that question, we can ask, so is there a countable set of uh, super operators? Um, such that for every uh, super operator, there's a, a monotone net, or you know you could even ask for it to be a monotone sequence. It wouldn't matter because it's countable. Um, uh, in, coming from this countable set, such that uh, you know everything is expressible as a least upper bound. Uh, and then the answer to this question, to, to this more refined question, is no. And so therefore, the answer to the stronger question is also no. So uh, now we can kind of ask, well, why not? Um, so the easiest example to show it for is to just use uh, two by two matrices, which we can then draw, and uh, show that we can't get all the projections, all the one-dimensional projections of, uh, on, the, on, two, on two by two matrices. So I've drawn the kind of the, uh, the positive cone coming from below, and then the uh, at the, the top vertex of that, uh, that kind of double cone is the identity matrix. So kind of looking at, at the DCPO we're looking at is uh, the unit interval on the two by two matrices. And so the dotted circle, which is really supposed to be a sphere, but I don't have enough dimensions to draw it, uh, is the one dimensional projections, you know, which is the block sphere. Uh, and so we're kind of asking, can, can we just uh, can we approximate projections from below with a countable set? And then the, the key fact is that if you have a one-dimensional projection, then uh, and you have a positive operator, so you have an element of this uh, set, and it's less than this one-dimensional projection, then it's actually proportional to it. And the, the reason is not that difficult to see from the diagram. It's just that uh, you have the, the one cone coming up like this. And then when you say things are below this projection, it's things that kind of come down like this. And there's only a single line where the two cones actually intersect, um, which is the, the line of things proportional to uh, this one dimensional projection. So in the paper, I, I did a more algebraic proof rather than the geometric uh, what proof. And then um, it follows from that. If you've picked this uh, this set of um, this uh, subset B, which I've written here in, uh, in the two by two matrices, and then for all one dimensional projections, there's some uh, monotone net of uh, of uh, elements that approximates uh, this projection each each projection then you can just pick one and it will be below this projection. 
And so you can define a function that goes from one-dimensional projections into B, um, and such that you have a non-zero element every time. You can pick a, a non-zero element every time. And then since it's proportional to the projection, uh, you can't get two different projections from each other by just multiplying by a real number. So it has to be an injective function. And, uh, and therefore, the, the set we started with can't be countable uh, because the set of projections is not countable. It has the cardinality of the reals. Okay. So how do we relate that back to unitaries? So first we kind of generalize it to n by n matrices um, and, and still keep it with uh, one-dimensional projections, but on n by n matrices. But we need to make it work for super operators, not for um, the unit interval. Um, so we do have the choi yamilkovsky isomorphism. So the, the completely positive maps, uh, is, you know, it makes the completely positive maps isomorphic to the, the positive elements. Uh, but it's, it's not an isomorphism uh, of convict sets or of uh, ordered, um, ordered sets uh, between uh, completely positive trace non-increasing maps and uh, the unit interval. Uh, so we have to redo the argument where instead of um, being just the positive part of the, uh, instead of being rather the, um, the unit interval, in, in, uh, in the n by n matrices, it's the positive part of the unit ball um, for some arbitrary norm on n by n matrices. And then to get the, uh, the super operators, what you do is you uh, restrict to the case of the operator norm. And that gives you a, a subset of uh, n times m by n times m matrices isomorphic to it. And then uh, the conclusion from that, that the fact that this argument works again, is that you, don't, you can't find a countable set of superoperators that approximate from below an arbitrary superoperator. Yeah, so, uh, so that's the first part. And then, oh yeah, so we, we do have an alternative statement in, that's more domain theoretic, which is that uh, uh, the set of continuous, uh, sorry, the set of complete, the set of uh, superoperators uh, doesn't have a countable basis as a, uh, a DCPO. Yeah. Okay. And and that since uh, since unitaries define completely positive maps, uh, we can't approximate an arbitrary unitary either. Uh, and then when we actually do want to approximate unitaries, uh, we have to use the, the norm topology. Uh, we can't use the domain uh, theoretic topologies like the Scott topology and the Lawson topology. And that's why no one else has ever actually found a use for them uh, in, uh, in this case. Why everybody skips it is because they, they aren't useful. Um, and uh, we also need to use non-monotone sequences. So there's a, kind of a slight problem, which is that the least upper bound and the limit in the uh, Lerfner order are both the same. So it, to approximate one unit tree from another, you need to approach it by an, a non-monotone sequence. All right, so in the remainder of the time, I'll uh, just go over the, uh, the infinite dimensional results uh, that's related. So uh, since uh, n by n matrices are a continuous DCPO, uh, we can ask if that's true for infinite dimensional C star algebras. So why do I say infinite dimensional C star algebras? So uh, a kind of infinite dimensional C star algebra, which is infinite dimensional W star algebras, uh, have been used for program semantics by several authors, again, at, uh, at this uh, conference or previous versions of this conference. Uh, and, we, and so it's, it's a natural way to extend it. Uh, one first problem is that it's not true that every C star algebra in the infinite dimensional case is uh, a DCPO. And so the, the counterexample there is the continuous functions on uh, the unit interval in the reals. Uh, and if it is, we just we call it, just give it a name, which is unfortunately not directed complete. They, they decided it would be called monotone complete. But uh, we can use some results that are known to um, people who study this field, uh, that they have a good theory of uh, projections. Uh, and the projections form a lattice. And... Um, 
We also have this fact that um, Scott continuous maps were used in uh, C-star algebras before, I think they were used in uh, program semantics, because uh, there's this old characterization of W-star algebras as monotone complete C-star algebras that are separated by their Scott continuous uh, states. So the key fact is that um, if you have a monotone complete C-star algebra, the projections form a continuous lattice if uh, the unit interval is a continuous DCPO. And so that's not automatic from the fact it's a sub-DCPO. It's not true that being continuous passes down to sub-DCPOs, but it does pass down to sub-lattices. Um, and then and it's an odd fact that the projection lattice is a sub-lattice of the unit interval, even though the unit interval is not a lattice in the non-commutative case. And what I mean by that is uh, it preserves all the joins and meets. Uh, the inclusion map preserves all the joins and meets even though the, uh, there are extra possible joins and meets in the uh, unit interval that don't exist. Um, it then uh, turns out that um, uh, you can reprove this known result, but in this uh, generalized case, that a, so a sub-lattice of a continuous DCPO is a continuous lattice. And then, uh, so Matisse Ranella had asked a question online, and uh, Nick Weaver had asked it, which, which gave a characterization uh, of um, when a W star algebra has a continuous projection lattice. And then this can be uh, reproved for um, uh, AW star algebras, and therefore for monotone complete uh, C star algebras. And then, since uh, Selenjo already proved the finite dimensional case, it is continuous. It's an if and only if. So, a uh, so it means that um, yeah, a, uh, a, a, sorry, a, a C-star algebra is, has a continuous um, unit interval if and only if it has a continuous projection lattice, if and only if um, it's a product of finite dimensional matrix algebras. But it is allowed to be an infinite product. It doesn't have to be a finite product. And then uh, the last statement, I think, is that uh, so these things have already come up. In, um, uh, in the literature, and uh, Cornell calls these uh, hereditarily atomic. So it's that uh, you have being a continuous DCPO for a C-star algebra is the same as being hereditarily atomic. Okay, so that's the end. Thank you, Robert. Questions for Robert? Thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, you especially uh, talk about C-star algebra and double uh, star algebra. Uh, however, uh, if you consider the uh, programming language, the target unitary operator or CP map should be uh, computable, means that the uh, elements are uh, computable on the, this uh, computational basis. In that case, <coughs> uh, can you make <coughs> countable basis to approximate that? Yeah, so this is something I did think about, and that's why um, it's only a preprint and not a submitted publication, because uh, I did think about how to show that there's a, so I think it is true, or I, I conjecture that it is true that um, like if you were to take uh, a universal set of unitaries, you still wouldn't be able to get all the computable ones, but it needs a different argument. And so at the moment, all it says is like, even if you have access to an oracle that will give you uncomputable functions, you can't approximate all uncomputable unitaries. Um, but yes, the, the computable unitaries are technically countable, and so uh, there needs to be a separate argument. Uh, but, uh, and I have like, some idea of how to do this, but uh, I didn't uh, complete it yet. Thank you. Okay, one more question, and then... Okay, uh, do you have uh, some ideas about how we can uh, uh, use uh, or exploit continuity beyond what has already been done? Because there in the, okay, in the, we have a paper where 
we show you can you know combine it with uh, classical probability and uh, you know combine it with the classical valuations model from DCPU. But uh, other than this, uh, can can you see some other use uh, for uh, continuity there for the domain structure of a one one algebra? Hmm. So n not yet. Uh, in fact, like what I'm thinking of doing is uh, is really to go outside is to just use the non-continuous ones, uh, uh, but then use uh, instead of trying to work only with order to work with topology as well. Uh, so that, that's why I didn't really think about like how can we take more advantage of the continuity that's already there. I just thought, well, since it seems like we don't have enough, uh, we should just step outside uh, continuous TCPOs. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. All right. More questions uh, for Robert. Coffee break, I suggest. So let's thank again the speaker. <laughs> Next talk, we have Matt Wilson. Uh, a mathematical framework for transformations of physical processes and higher order funkiness. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Lots of higher order stuff. OK. Actually, just just. Just a few minutes of higher order stuff. Um, yeah, OK, I want to start by thanking the organizers. This is, I think, one of the first uh, physical conferences I've ever been to. And it's been really nice. And yeah, looking forward to the next one. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, this is a talk about an attempt, or one of probably many attempts, to try and put together what I would say are two of the really nice lessons that we've had from quantum foundations and quantum information in the last couple of decades. One of them is about categorical quantum mechanics, and one of them is about higher order quantum theory. So, will the detail? What are the lessons? The first lesson is that if you think about quantum theory, starting by thinking about <laughs> boxes and wires, then you can actually learn quite a lot. Um, in fact, this is a really powerful way to start thinking about quantum theory and build up from there. Uh, kind of in like categorical language, this means that we were able to learn a lot about quantum theory by thinking about it first of, first of all, as a symmetric monoidal category, which is just the piece of maths that says you have boxes that you can plug together. Okay. And OK, just a completely non-exhaustive list of applications. Is It's been the start of some reconstruction programs for quantum theory. It's been uh, the source of one of the ways of defining resource theories in quantum theory. Uh, and in general, it's not exactly an application, but like one of the nice things about this is it gives you one way of talking about structure-preserving maps between different physical theories, so long as they look like this. OK, so the second kind of one of the other big lessons of the last two decades is that it's useful to think about maps that you can do to maps. So the kinds of things that you can do to quantum processes. Uh, so I'll be calling these things super maps. And uh, once you start thinking about maps you can do to maps, it's, it's quite a kind of powerful like place to go. It kind of helps you to envisage a load of new quantum information uh, processing protocols. Um, and it gives you a new way to study quantum causality in terms of kind of interventions, uh, in which case it's often referred to as the kind of process matrix framework. Okay, so we had two lessons, and kind of the first lesson you could state as a sentence, and it said, we could learn a lot about quantum theory and quantum maps by thinking about them from the framework of symmetric monoidal categories. What we want to do is be able to say the same sentence or start saying the, kind, the same kind of sentence for higher order stuff. So we want to be able to say, we can learn a lot about quantum supermaps starting from the framework of X, where X should be something like kind of symmetric monoidal categories are for normal physical theories. OK, so the talk is about proposing at least some of the structure that you'd expect to find in whatever X is. So it's all about just kind of starting this idea. Um, so why would you care about doing this? Kind of for a lot of the reasons that we care in the standard quantum approach. Maybe we can think about reconstructing quantum supermaps from simple principles. 
maybe we can have another approach to defining resource theories of quantum supermaps. Uh, and again, maybe we can develop some kind of meta theory of supermaps, structure preserving maps that allow us to compare all different proposals for what higher order theories might be. Okay, so we'll put forward a suggestion for at least a bit of the structure that we're expecting to find in X. And that bit of structure can be phrased as follows. We expect that when we have a theory V, which is a theory of supermaps for another theory C, then we would expect that part of the data we have is a V symmetric monoidal category C. Now, that's a concept of enriched category theory. And whilst I say category a lot, I'm kind of scared of categories. So I'm going to try and explain this claim with just boxes and wires. OK. So what's in a V symmetric monoidal category C? Why do I care about these things? Well, first of all, you have two symmetric monoidal categories. V is going to be like your theory of supermaps. It's also symmetric monoidal because you can compose supermaps most likely in sequence and in parallel. And it's acting on another thing called C, which is another circuit theory, another symmetric monoidal category. But in what sense can you think of the first one as acting on the second one? Well, in this piece of data, for each pair of systems in your lower order place, there's a system which you can think of as like the system that represents the processes from A to B in the higher order place. Okay. In what sense does it represent the space of processes? Well, there's a bijection between the processes from A to B in your category C and the states of type A to B in V. There's more to say about the sense in which V can be interpreted as acting on C. So here, as soon as you have a process in V, it's, it's acting on the states of its theory, so it's acting on the stuff from C. So that's a nice start. But also in this piece of data is the guarantee that you can do some very fundamental manipulations in V that you'd expect to if you were able to do supermaps. Things in C can happen in sequence or in parallel. If I can do supermaps and you give me two processes, surely I can put them in sequence or put them in parallel. So this kind, these kinds of maps are present in V for any V symmetric monoidal category C. So there's the one in sequence, and there's just an intuitive picture for putting them in parallel. OK, so that's really all there is to say about v -symmetric monoidal a v-symmetric monoidal category C. That's really basically all the data up to categorical stuff. OK, so examples include basically all the instances of things like supermaps that we're used to working with. And in each case, the kind of tensor product in V you should think of as the no signaling tensor not the tensor that represents the space of all bipartite processes, because it's the space that allows us to compose and make feedback. OK. So what do we learn from this? Well, the first thing we can try and do is get back to this structure-preserving map thing, starting to think about the kind of meta theory of theories of supermaps. So consider, ex for example, this diagram here, which represents a series of intuitive embeddings. We know that, for instance, going from like the top left to the bottom right, unitary combs, they're an example of all quantum supermaps on the bottom right. Unitaries, they're an example of all quantum channels on the bottom right. So in a sense, the thing on the top left embeds in the thing on the bottom right. And the way in which unitary combs act on unitaries, it's the same as the way in which supermaps act on channels. So we'd like a language that allows us to express this embedding formally rather than just being an intuitive thing we know. So we can do this. We need a kind of structure preserving map for the super theory, a structure preserving map for the normal theory. And we need some kind of compatibility about how, how the two theories are actually related. Now it turns out that you can formalize this just by writing down all the kind of structure preservingness that you would like. Uh, and it's okay, but once you start trying to prove that these things compose to make like a genuinely valid kind of meta theory, um, yeah, things get really awkward. I actually don't know how to prove they compose really directly. However, you can observe uh, that these things are, in a way, a construction applied to some other standard concepts of enriched category theory. So in fact, you can think of these structure-preserving maps as morphisms in something called the Grothendieck construction of 
something called the change of base functor for enriched symmetric monoidal categories. Now that's a load of words. <laughs> I'm not going to explain what any of those mean, but the key takeaway is because you can view them as resulting from some categorical construction, you have the guarantee, which is you can compose these things. They form their own category that you can use and play with, and you can use to compare different theories of supermaps. Okay. So, um, just as we were playing around with these, a result that ended up being useful for later, as well as we, we started thinking about kind of stacks of theories of supermaps. What if theory three is a theory of supermaps somehow for theory two, which is a theory of supermaps somehow for theory one? Um, well, when you have a tower like this, you can always show that there are these kinds of structure preserving maps that lift you one level up on the tower at a time. So these kinds of things you would see if you kind of unpacked standard higher order quantum theory. Um, yeah. Okay. The second thing we tried to do, just kind of hitting the ground running with this framework of thinking about things as enriched categories, is to see what other reasonable properties or interesting or useful properties of higher order quantum theory can we view as resulting from adding other operational principles. So we're trying to start slowly doing the kind of quantum foundations game of starting with the basic stuff, add operational principles, see what we learned, see what in higher order quantum theory is a consequence of what else. Okay, so the thing we focused on is that in higher order quantum theory, and here I mean the kinds of uh, constructions in which you have a theory and its supermaps and the super supermaps and the super super supermaps all together in one big theory. That's what I mean by higher order quantum theory. It's, um, in these kinds of theories, you have a convenient property of currying. It says that whenever you have uh, a process with two inputs A and C and one output B, you can think about this as something that takes one input C and produces a process from A to B. So this is a convenient property. Uh, and it, it always seems so fundamental as, as to be something you might kind of just ask for, for a iterated theory. But we found that you could kind of see this as derived from the other principles that we're mentioning so far and adding more stuff. So, okay, just terminology, things were currying. In category words, this is a closed uh, symmetric monoidal category. Okay, so how do we add principles to get back currying? Uh, the first thing is to say formally the thing I just said. Higher order quantum theory is the kind of theory that has all of its own supermaps. Okay, so it's one big theory that is its own theory of supermaps. You can formalize this, and that's observation one that will become an axiom. The second thing is that objects really exist in the theory as no more than encoding the space of states on them. So there's an equivalence between any system A and the space of the system that represents the space of states on A. And the third thing, which we had to kind of write some new words for is the following sentence. The usage function in higher order quantum theory is faithful. Okay, so these are, bas these are really intuitive pictures, um, but it's more fun than writing the formal stuff. Uh, roughly what's happening here is in um, any theory that satisfies the first two conditions, or even less actually, you can think about taking the output of any supermap S and putting it into one part of one of these sequential composition supermaps which you know you have by, by assumption from the framework. Um, and really, if you, if you look at the picture, putting it in the right-hand slot like this is really just kind of putting a fancy case around the supermap. It kind of looks like the same thing, it's just it's packaged weirdly. Um, so another feature that higher order quantum theory has, which is, seems like a really quite reasonable feature, is that whenever S and T are the same supermaps, then just packaging them in these weird cases preserves that sameness. They're the same at the top if they're the same at the bottom and vice versa. Okay, so these are three observations that all seem very reasonable about uh, infinitely iterated theories of supermaps. And it turns out that these axioms together are exactly just the definition of a closed monoidal category. So they do imply currying, but they also just are the requirement of currying. Nice. Like it's, it's, it's really the same thing. So they actually characterize the notion of a closed monoidal category, um, which I think probably to a category theorist is, 
is not too necessarily surprising, but it's, it's a nice way to kind of view currying as a consequence of what, at least from our angle, felt like more primitive kind of ideas. OK. Um, you can actually uh, generalize this a bit. We went back to thinking about these towers of theories. So rather than thinking about a theory already which contains all of its own supermaps, why don't we kind of start thinking a bit more externally? We imagine some tower of theories of supermaps again. Each one a theory of supermaps for the one below it. OK. And then we imagine so now we had to use this notion of structure-preserving map that we found before. We imagine that this tower has nice enough structure-preserving maps that lift you all the way through. The ones that we could freely generate, they had to be what you'd call uh, full and faithful um, in a categorical sense. And we found if they embed into one big theory in a nice enough way that you would then consider to be uh, the kind of global theory that this tower is part of, and if you ask for the kinds of axioms that we we're asking before, then again, this big world that the tower embeds into will again be closed monoidal. It will again be guaranteed to have curry. OK. Whoops. You don't want to know what's next. You want to know what we did first. So this talk was about studying theories of supermaps from the perspective of process theories, studying them in the same way that we study uh, quantum theory as a process theory. Okay, so we identified what we felt like with some key structural fe features of theories of supermaps. We used it to at least come up with structure preserving maps that care about that bit of structure. So it's the beginning of trying to put together this kind of meta theory of supermaps. Um, and we gave this uh, characterization of a quite a simple fundamental thing in higher order quantum theory, the possibility to curry. We characterize that in terms of other operational principles. So we started showing that you can play these kinds of quantum foundations games uh, at this higher order level. OK. So what's next? Well, we have a, we have a kind of definition of some of the extra structure that you maybe want to consider as part of the definition of a higher order theory. And the way resource theories were defined, at least in the kind of categorical context, is it was like, OK, a physical theory is a symmetric monoidal category. So a resource theory is a sub-symmetric monoidal category. So now we have a bit more that we can say about what a kind of higher order theory is. We can say a bit more about like what a sub-theory is. So maybe we're a bit, maybe we're close to proposing some other definitions um, of what resource theories of higher order processes sh should be. OK. Uh, we have build a kind of meta theory and a category. And so now we can start asking whether certain theories of supermaps satisfy or are characterized by universal properties in the world of all possible theories of supermaps. Um, and something we'd really like is to have a more elaborate space of examples and something that um, uh, more recently I've been working on uh, with Giro Kirabella and Alex Kissinger is trying to freely construct examples of this kind of structure um, from arbitrary circuit theories. And I think that's all I want to say, except for thanks for listening. So yeah, cheers. <laughs>
quantum, that there are sorry there are signaling quantum channels. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how restrictive this uh, construction is. Uh, if anything, it's not restrictive enough for the reasons you're saying, in that like there will be things that are instances of this kind of structure where C is the quantum channels, which which we probably wouldn't accept yet as valid theories of supermaps, precisely because there's no guarantee that these higher order maps are well defined on when they're applied on part of any bipartite process rather than just the non-signaling ones. So you should really think about this as kind of part of the story. You need to also at some point, and this will hopefully come at some point, <laughs> add this to an extra piece of structure, which makes sure that these things are defined on the space of all processes. You need to now introduce another tensor product, ask how they should be interacting together, taking guidance from uh, things like uh, uh, the work of uh, Alex and Sander and Alex and Will and um, the higher order quantum theory constructions where we, we can see some of how these two tensor products interact and basically kind of steal how they interact and ask for them as axioms. One more, maybe? Thanks for the very nice talk. So we also talk on this other approach, like you have some uh, BV logic model, you know, you, are, you encode this kind of super different type of supermats with types, but inside only one category. And here you seem to have something uh, with completely different point of view, with this tower, uh -huh. this enrichment. Yeah. Do you know what is the connection of this? Do you have kind of, don't know, functor that just make your tower collapse into a category with more types or something like this? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is really why the first types of questions we asked were these questions and this question. Uh, really, really the goal was to say, okay, first of all, the concept of a theory and the theory of supermaps that are acting on it felt to us like something we'd like to keep separate and then talk about how we make them the same, like from there. So yeah, we definitely wanted to keep them separate to start with. Uh, and then, well, you can, you can immediately kind of adapt it to think of something that is its own theory of supermaps by just taking C and V to both be C. Uh, so that's like a, that's the kind of naive way to do it. But also you may be more interested in taking limits. Like I'm kind of expecting that as we try and do constructions, you know, when you know you have compact closure or you know you have various properties that allow you to construct supermaps in the way that you do in the core C construction, for example, um, basically, it's very powerful. It allows you to do a lot very quickly. Uh, we found that as we're now working on freely constructing supermaps from arbitrary circuit theories, it's at least we're at least kind of having to work step by step. And so this is also kind of preemptive in that we, we think in the end we want to make things like the thing on the right-hand side, but we think in, dem in general we're going to have to do it like on the left-hand side by building one by one and then taking some kind of categorical limit afterwards. So in this talk, I'm going to present some work uh, that we did with Bob and with our student, uh, Maria Sazino, uh, about seeing evolution of quantum fields, so actual quantum fields, from a functorial perspective. So encoding properties of the evolution of quantum fields in space times, discretized, approximated in various ways as properties of certain functors that uh, uh, that we can define. And the starting point for this work really is a view of space times as causal orders, or to be precise, as directed uh, acyclic graphs. So we can think of space times as consisting of a bunch of events that are connected by a causal relationship, and we represent this by a directed acyclic graph, where we have points, are the events, and two points are connected by directed edge if they are in a causal succession uh, relationship. And here we have an example with six points, but you can take examples with infinitely many points. Finiteness is not a requirement in this work. And on such, uh, on such uh, order theoretic uh, uh, space times, if you will, or causal orders, as we refer to them, 
uh, we can consider an equivalent of space-like slices. And we can just formalize this from an order theoretic perspective as subsets where no two points are causally related. And there's a picture on the right of some of the, in fact, all of the maximal slices in this particular sixth event causal order. There's a slice at the bottom which consists of the points AB, there's AD, there's AF, there's CD, CF, and EF. These are the maximal ones, but of course we can also take any subset, any subset of these and we'll all get again a slice. It's not just one that spans sort of across all possible paths, but those are also valid slices. So we don't necessarily consider maximal extended kind of Cauchy-like slices. We consider all, all possible slices. And those will be the fundamental objects that we want to define our fields over. So the idea is on these slices, we can specify some data freely because fields can be specified freely on such, on such slices, both maximal extended one and local ones. And then we want to use functors to encode the way in which fields evolve across different slices or certain pairs of slices. And this is where the second ingredient comes in. So we have slices, how are they related? Of course, it doesn't necessarily make sense to think that taking any two slices, we can always evolve the field from one to the other. They could be space-like separated. So it might not make any sense to ask for an evolution. But of course, there are some cases where the data on a slice gamma should be determined in a unique way. Field data on a slice gamma should be determined in a unique way by field data on some other slice sigma. Where, what are these examples? Well, they are the examples where all the paths, all the causal paths that end onto gamma, you trace them back in time, they always hit sigma. So the idea is, of course, the field evolves locally in a certain sense. And if we want to know the field value at a point of gamma, all we have to do is take all the possible causal paths backwards. If all of them intersect sigma, then we always have enough data to determine the field value of that point. We can do this for all points of gamma. And in fact, we don't even have to think about the points of gamma. We just think of the slice on its own as an atomic object. There's a good reason not to think of it as a grainy object sometimes. So we can define a partial order on slices. And the partial order is sigma is before gamma if every path ending at gamma and extended all the way backwards intersects sigma at some point. So the data on sigma determines the data on gamma. And this gives a partial order, but of course, we are category theorists, so we don't want to work with partial orders. We work with a category. It's just a postal category. It's just another way of saying it is a partial order, but in such a way that we will then be able to define functors on it. So really, if we take the possible slices on this five event causal order, there are one, two, three, four, five maximal slices, but then we also have to take the subsets. And of course, if we have data on a slice, then we also have data on a subset of a slice. We can trace and get some marginal state. So this order starts with the maximal slices in the past, and then it sort of branches and reaches the maximal slices. And then from the maximal slices, we also obtain all the possible subsets. And at the very end, the terminal object in this postal category is just the empty slice. We can always get the data on the empty slice from any slice, because there is no data on the empty slice. It's just terminal. There's just going to be one thing on there. So this is effectively the, the basic object. This is the category that we start from. And on this, we will define our functors that will encode the evolution and the possible data containers for field values. But we don't just want a category, we want a bit more. We want a monoidal category, if possible. Now, we don't just work with sequential composition, our systems should also be parallelly composed. And so we ask, which slice, for which slices does it make sense to ask that we can compose in parallel? Where does it make sense to always define sort of a parallel state from the individual marginal states? And that is when slices are space-like separated. In what sense? Well, neither slice intersects the causal cone of the other backwards or forwards. So in this particular picture, we have two slices, sigma and gamma. Uh, on the left, I have highlighted the causal, well, on both pictures, I highlighted the causal cones in the past and in the future for sigma. On the left, gamma is outside, doesn't intersect either cone. So the two slices are space-like separated. On the right, gamma intersects the future cone of sigma. Equivalently, sigma intersects the past cone of gamma, which is not depicted. And therefore, they're not space-like separated. What we get from this is 
a partially monoidal categorical structure. So not all pairs of objects can be composed. We can only take the tensor product of two slices when they are space-like separated, but this is, this is well-behaved. There's like associativity constraints that hold. So these, these kind of categories are not just there's some partial operation. It's some partial operation with additional consistency conditions that we check, they all hold, everything works quite fine. And there's also a higher categorical way of thinking of these particular categories as certain, um, a certain structure in, in a two category. So we have this, we have a category with sequential composition of slices. Of course, it's just, it's a poseidon category. There is nothing interesting in the sequential side other than the order, but also parallel composition of slices that allows us to extend, think about extended data. And from this, we can define what it means to have a field. And now our definition of a field does everything at once. It defines, for each slice, it will define the space of things that Let's go start with this one and then go backwards. For each slice, it defines the space of possible field states on that slice. And for each arrow, it defines the unique map that evolves the field from the starting slice sigma to the ending slice gamma. So there's both things at once. There's the possible states, and for each state, the evolution that maps from one slice to a slice in its future. And this is not unitary evolution, importantly, because these slices are allowed to be marginalized. So it will also encode the possibilities of discarding information automatically. Uh, the generic setting for this work is what's known as a slice category. It's not necessarily the category of all slices on a causal order. That might be too fine-grained. Typically, when you think of Minkowski space-time, let's say, and you say, I want a space-like slice, you don't mean I want all possible subsets of points that are space-like separated. Some of those are really horrible. You want ones which are, I don't know, continuous differentiable, infinitely many uh, times differentiable, smooth in various ways, analytic. Depends on the applications. So you can characterize the kind of subcategories that have the right properties for these functors to be defined. And those we call slice categories. Of course, we can always, in the finite case, we can always take all of the slices. But when you go to Minkowski space time, you want the well behaved slices. And we take monoidal functors on, on this. So we want functors that respect both the sequential side and the parallel side because we'll get some interesting field theoretic properties for free from these functorial conditions. And the target, the field category, where the fields live and where the revolutions live, is any symmetric monoidal category. We can take CPM of a field, we can take sister algebras, phenomenal algebras, anything. And now we look at why, what, what does functoriality buy us? Why do we want to do this? Well, the fact that the functor respects sequential composition of slices in this category tells you that if you start from the field, a field state on slice sigma and you evolve it to an intermediate slice gamma and then you evolve it further on a slice delta, that's the same as evolving the state from sigma to delta in one go. So evolution composes, which is expected. It's, it's what it means to be a semigroup, for example. But also, it's a monoidal functor. So it tells us something about what happens when we try to evolve the field state between pairs of slices that are space-like separated. And this is, it tells us that this particular kind of evolution factorizes, and it's known as the principle of locality. It sounds weird at first, but you have to remember that none of these slices is related to the other. So they're really like living in different uh, fragments of space-time. The initial state can be entangled, but the evolution cannot be entangling if there is no causal relation between the slices. And this, is, this comes for free from monoidality. And finally, by composing monoidality and functoriality, we also get terminality for free. We get that if you want to know, starting from sigma, what is the state on gamma, but you have the state on gamma together with delta, you can just take the state on the larger slice and discard, quote unquote, the part that lives on delta and marginalize to gamma. And this tells you that doing first the evolution from sigma to gamma and delta and then discarding is the same as just evolving to gamma directly. So you don't just get evolution in the typical unitary sense, you get evolution plus marginalization in all possible combinations, in a single functor. Everything is packaged into a functor. And an example, in fact, I think one of the original motivating examples for this work is that there is a canonical way to take quantum cellular automata 
and construct functors from them. What is the functor if I, what is the state on a slice? Well, the state on a slice is typically just the tensor product of the state on its points. It, this might be a continuous tensor product if your slice is continuous, but typically these are discretized. Uh, what is the evolution between two slices? Well, the evolution is the network of unitaries that perform the local evolution for your quantum cellular automaton. And then, of course, this is typically a block of unitaries, but your slices might be slightly smaller, so you just discard all of the, all of the outputs that don't matter. And you can either do this at the end, so you can do a Cauchy slice evolution and then discard, or you can just discard along the causal boundary. It, it gives you exactly the same result because of terminality. So this is a canonical way of doing this, and it's a canonical construction for all quantum cellular automata. But also, rather interestingly, if we take regions of space-times as collections of slices. We don't think of them as collections of points because we don't have points in this work. They might not really exist. We have slices, but we can always say, okay, a region, our slices are, are partial. We take all of the possible slices that live in this region. There's a lot of them. They intersect. They're not independent in any way. But we can take them and we can say, okay, what is the free way of setting states on these slices? Well, the free way of setting states is for each slice you set a state independently. Just take a state in its, uh, in its state space. Now, of course, these are not valid states for the region, but you can ask that the states you pick are the ones invariant under all possible field evolutions between all possible pairs of slices. So you, don't take, you take all possible families of states on all possible slices that are invariant under field evolution from one slice to the other. And now this thing, this collection of states, forms a pre-shift, and it is the kind of thing that you find in algebraic quantum field theory. So if you now have a category, a different category of bounded regions that is derived from this category of slices, and this category of bounded regions has a pre-sheaf of local states assigned to it that behaves as you would expect from a QFT. So this work has sort of two main directions. One of them is it captures quantum, it encapsulates quantum cellular automata in a functorial package, but the other is it gives a different perspective on how the state bundles, the state pre sheaves of uh, AQFT are constructed from sort of a practical perspective. And that is, that is pretty much it in terms of nice pictures that were in the paper. Therefore, that's pretty much it in terms of my presentation. Um, but because there was one more picture, it's here. You don't have to really consider discretizations of your space times. You can consider towers of discretizations under coarse graining, where multiple events get sort of collapsed into a single event. And this entire construction is stable in that sense. You can look at slices in the coarse grained version, and you can lift them to bundles of slices on the fine grained version, and everything is sort of well behaved uh, functorially. That's, that's the end of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for a very interesting talk. And for you talk about uh, uh, algebraic quantum field theory, and uh, in that theory, the, for every uh, bounded open region of the Minkowski space corresponds to the phoneme algebra of uh, bounded observables. And then, uh, if the two regions of space are like, separated, but the boundary is shared, in that case, the composite uh, system is not a tensor product, then uh, how do you <coughs> talk about uh, <coughs> monoidal category structure of that case. Thank you. Yes, there are a lot of, uh, this is uh, one slide of, of a lot of, of comments and, and discussion about this. Uh, so two things there, uh, two answers. Uh, one, it is, yes, there's, a, there's an effect perspective on algebras, but in these, in these particular examples, there's also an equivalent state perspective. So you can think of algebras as the algebra of local effects, or you can think of the algebra of states over which the effects uh, can be defined, and of course the two are dual. So while the, it, the traditional take is that you define the algebra of effects, of local effects on a region, but you can also take the algebra of possibly marginalized states on the region, and that gives you an and then define the effects on top of that algebra. And that's, it's the space of states, and you take the effects on that. So there's additional structure if you want to reconstruct 
AQFT and we didn't claim that we reconstructed AQFT in all cases. We just gave some examples of things that look like the bundles that you get in AQFT, but it's not an exact correspondence. And indeed, it's not fully exact because our tensor product of regions is restricted to boundaries that might come very close, but can't overlap. So if you take our regions, in a sense, are open, and you can take two open regions that come really, really, really close, but there's, at the overlap, there's no requirement of continuity imposed. If you want to impose a requirement of continuity, there's additional structure that needs to be put onto the functors. Uh, we had a draft of that, but we didn't put that in the final paper. But I, we can have a, a chat about what that entails. But yeah, both excellent questions. Uh, yeah, I think we will at some point get, a, get around to it. Thanks, that was really nice. Uh, how, how much goes horrifically wrong if you start putting cycles in your graphs? Um, from this perspective, everything and nothing. Uh, you can always add cycles by making, a, by making a super operator, which brings you out of this entire framework because you have to go into a higher category, I mean a, a category ne in the next layer of, of, a, of a tower, if you will, sure. in which case nothing really goes wrong on the lower level. You just get a, you get a really terrible category next. You might get the, I don't know, the Deutsch model where there's like, you know, the linearity trap and uh, probabilities work weird. And so that, that could happen. Uh, but in the other sense, everything goes wrong because you can't do any of this anymore. This is, this is all predicated on the fact that there's a total order on the slices and that fails the moment that you have any loop. Sure. So the only way of dealing with loops is this sort of categorical semantics for time travel approach where you have to cut them and presume that there's a super operator that deals with it. Uh, but then it brings you out of the theory, so that saves you in a sense, but you have to make an ad hoc higher theory that deals with it. Sure, okay, thanks. Okay, I think we need to go to the next speaker, so let's thank Stefano again. So let me start by thanking all of the organizers for this this great event. I really enjoyed the start of it and uh, I'm sort of sad to be missing the, the last couple of days, but what I was there for was, was fantastic. So I want to talk about some work that I've been doing recently um, and also not so recently uh, with Marietta, Stefano and Bob. And this has been on sort of time symmetry generally, but in this talk, I'm gonna focus in particular on sort of the quantum examples although everything sort of generalizes uh, quite simply. So this talk really is about sort of two of our favorite structures that we have in categorical quantum mechanics. So the discarding map and the dagger, and sort of the tension that we have between these. And, and this tension um, can be captured uh, by this sort of picture. This, this was uh, earlier this week. Um, Slightly more formally, we can capture it by this kind of picture. So we have the sort of causality axiom, uh, which says that if we throw away all of the outputs of the process, this is the same as throwing away the inputs. So this is all about discarding. But on the other hand, we have the dagger, which is about reflecting processes. And there's a, a tension between these two. And basically, we see that the uh, discarding plays nicely when we're in this category of completely positive space preserving maps, whereas the dagger only really makes sense when we're talking about the category of all completely positive maps, so we forget about the space preserving condition. And quite a while ago now, um, Bob and Stefano and I uh, wrote a paper about this tension, uh, which was called Eternal Noise, or something on those lines. Um, so here is a, a reconstruction of the moment of discovery of this paper. Um, so you can see that you've got the tension between the dagger and the discarding. We've got Bob sitting in the middle reading his favorite book. But Bob was uh, maybe reading this book after the conference dinner or so, so he's, he's made a bit of a mistake. And he is finding that today when he's reading his favorite book, the, all that's in the book is just noise. There's just lots of noise. In particular, he was, he was looking at, at this uh, picture at the time. So you can see in this picture that you've got this sort of up and down discarding map, which is the uniform noise state, and it's preserved by all of the processes in the theory. So we start with noise, 
something happens to it and we still have noise. So this is a theory of eternal noise. And obviously this equation just does not hold in the, the category of completely positive trace preserving maps. So when we take the time reverse of this theory, uh, we don't get the same theory again. So this is sort of a nice way of capturing the time asymmetry in, in quantum theory, or in standard operational quantum theory at least. Uh, so the, the title of this paper is uh, the time reverse of any causal theory is eternal noise. And that's basically the, the entire content of, of that paper. But then uh, later we started trying to think, OK, what, what can we do about this? Uh, we've seen this tension, but is there any way to resolve it? Is there any way that the dagger and the discarding map can ever, ever be friends with each other? And then with Marietta, we started thinking about these things, and we came up with really three different approaches to this problem. So I'm now going to very, I mean, it's a long paper that goes into this stuff, so I, I can't do any details, but I'll try and at least give some idea of what these three different approaches are and their relevance. The first approach is to say, well, we've got this sort of causality constraint, and we saw that if you time reverse things, then you get this sort of inverse eternal noise constraint or uh, sort of a retro causality constraint. And so we could just try and put both of these into our theory at once. Um, so to have sort of both of these conditions satisfied. And I, I talked to Bob about this sort of idea like right at the start of my PhD. And initially, Bob told me that this was, this was a stupid idea because you've only got one state in this theory, so it's going to be boring. And then maybe a month later, I came to the same conclusion that this was a stupid idea. Uh, I decided it was stupid for slightly different reasons, which was because you can't have any sort of copying of classical data in this theory. Um, and so but if we did try and do this anyway, then you end up with this category of unisil completely positive trace preserving maps. But as I said, I thought this was not very interesting. Uh, that was until last year, I think, when Lucien Hardy wrote a paper, which basically says, no, this isn't a stupid idea. Uh, you guys are just stupid to understand what's going on here. And I, I think I still am. Uh, but anyway, in, in this paper, Lucian takes this point of view and adds in something like a retro causality condition and essentially manages to recover standard descriptions of physics with states and effects and so on um, as sort of a representation of how we reason about a theory when we have sort of partial knowledge about things. So if you start conditioning on particular variables, then it turns out that this isn't some sort of trivial theory, but actually there's a lot of interesting structure to it, and you can um, actually reconstruct all of sort of quantum physics as we know it. Anyway, I, I encourage you to go and look at this paper because they can do a, a much better job of talking about these things than I can. But that's the that's the first option. You add in both of these constraints and see what happens. And surprisingly, it's actually interesting. The second option that we explored was to add in for every sort of system in our original theory, we can add in sort of a retrocausal counterpart system. So diagrammatically, we do it like this. You have sort of your original causal systems with arrows now pointing upwards, which satisfy the causality condition. And then for every one of those systems, we have sort of a, another system, like a dual system, with an arrow pointing downwards. And we demand that the processes between these retrocausal systems satisfy the sort of retrocausality condition. Now we've got these two different uh, kinds of systems some representing stuff going forwards in time and other stuff going backwards in time. And so we can have a dagger that then takes us between these two different kinds of systems. Um, these equations we expect to be satisfied, but we're not sure a priori that this should be consistent, in particular that it should be consistent with composition. And in fact, it turns out that if you only impose these axioms on your processes, then you can find processes that satisfy these but when you compose them, you get something that doesn't. Uh, so you can get sort of first time like curves, and then you can get scalars that are bigger than one, and, and these violate uh, this equation number four. So to sort of refine this idea, we add in a, a more stringent condition, which is this condition that says that for every process interacting between these two kinds of systems, um, we have two conditions that are basically no signaling conditions. So this first condition says that there exists a process F sub R, and this basically gives us no signaling from the causal systems to the retrocausal systems. 
and the other one says no signaling from the, the retrocausal systems, the causal systems. So this saves us from having those sort of closed time-like curves and everything is, is kind of uh, operationally well, well defined. Of course, when we do have this no signaling uh, kind of stuff, then it really leads you to ask, well, if I was sort of living in the causal part of the universe, could I ever have any sort of experimental test of the existence of this other stuff? Or has something kind of like symmetry breaking, simultaneous symmetry breaking uh, gone on, where now we just only see causal stuff, or only see retrocausal stuff? Uh, and I think this is an interesting open question, and, and we sort of speculated maybe something like uh, finding anomalous sources of decoherence or something like this might give sort of evidence of these other kinds of systems. Well, that's sort of super speculative. Um, and then we move on to the third approach. And this is basically to say, OK, we saw that this causality condition was getting in the way of the dagger. So what about if we just get rid of the causality constraint? We don't have either of these equations being satisfied for our theory now. Well, this would be something like the category of completely positive maps. Uh, and as we all know, this really doesn't define the valid operational theory. Um, again, we can sort of get loops, which give us scalars that are bigger than one, and there's no sort of operational meaning to these. So we need to find some way to make sure that the probability distributions we get in this theory are sort of genuine probability distributions. The first way we looked at to do this was to redefine composition in the category of completely positive maps. In particular, we define this new black dot composition, where every time we compose things, now we throw in some renormalization factor. At least as long as this renormalization factor is not zero. If it is zero, then we just set the process to be zero. And you can show that all of this is consistent, uh, it's associative, and universal, and so on. So let, let's call this category CP uh, bullet. And it turns out that this is basically just rediscovering something that was already known, uh, but putting in a in a bit more of a categorical kind of language. This, in particular, in the case where, say, E is just a state and F is a measurement, so the output A here is, is taken to be a classical system, then this recovers exactly the modified Born rule that's discussed in various papers. Uh, for example, this one by uh, Ereshkov and stuff. This, um, there's a couple of things that I, I didn't find particularly elegant about this approach. One was we had to have these sort of two different cases for composition. And the other... Ooh, a kind of modification. It, it didn't seem very principled in, in some sense. So we tried to find a, a nicer way of doing this. And we found out that you can equivalently come up to the same category by redefining the processes. And in particular, we do this by quotienting. Uh, so we work with equivalence classes of processes rather than the processes themselves. So equivalence classes of CP maps become our new processes. And in particular, we define this equivalence relation by saying that two processes are equivalent if they differ only by a strictly positive real number, this R here. So this you can define, uh, you can show gives uh, a valid sort of equivalence relation and that we can quotient by it and we get a new process theory, uh, CP quotiented. And it turns out that this is basically exactly the same as uh, the modified uh, composition rule that I talked about in the previous slide. Basically, you get to uh, the previous option uh, by picking particular representative elements for the equivalence classes, composing them, and re quotienting. And what's nice about this theory is that it sort of goes a, a step further uh, than the previous two options. Uh, the previous two options we found have a nice dagger structure, but actually when we do this uh, third option in either variant, it turns out this also gives us compact structure as well. So we've got cups and caps and can play with them nicely. Um, so this gives us something like a time neutral theory. There's no sort of the input-output structure of processes becomes totally irrelevant. But we've still got a bit of a problem here that if we end up getting zero processes, and these also don't really have a particularly good operational interpretation. So in particular, if we look at sort of the probability distributions or the, the classical states that we get, we get all of the probability distributions, 
but we also get sort of the zero vector as well. So we'd like to try and kill this off so we can have a deterministic theory or theory where everything in the theory can be thought of as uh, given an operational interpretation. So to do that is quite simple, uh, given what we've seen so far. We just define a new theory which only has uh, sort of processes, uh, the CP maps with some epsilon of uniform noise. So this is like a totally uh, de depolarizing map uh, with some probability epsilon, particularly greater than zero. Plus, we put in all of the wirings, the cuts, the caps, the swaps, and so on, to make sure that it uh, actually does define a, a valid uh, compact closed category. So we define the theory CP to the N, which is generated by these things, and then we can quotient that, and we find that this is a deterministic dagger compact symmetric monoidal category. So this now just has a single scalar, and all of the classical states now are just uh, classical probability distributions. So we have a, a nice uh, operational interpretation to everything living in this theory. So that's great. Um, so let me let me briefly summarize what we've seen. Uh, we've seen that there's various different ways you can take this sort of categorical or, or process theoretic uh, view of how to time symmetrize operational quantum theory, of how to make sort of the dagger and discarding and operationalism all uh, play nicely together. There's this approach, um, which I think Luke and Hardier has developed the best, where you have the retrocausal causality as an additional assumption. As uh, so we have single state and a single effect for every system. We've got this new approach we introduced where we have retrocausal counterparts for every system. And then we've got these, uh, this approach by Reshkoff and Surf, uh, which is a time neutral theory, which we gave sort of two different categorical presentations on it. So, What's really nice about the fact that this is process theoretic is that we can now apply it to many other theories. So in particular, we can start to look at sort of general time symmetric GPTs. Although interestingly, I should say that when you apply one of these uh, sort of symmetrization techniques to a GPT, in general, you get something that's not a GPT at the end of it. it so this nicely highlights some of the flexibility of the process theory way of thinking over the uh, GPT way of thinking. And you can also apply it to things like the academically restricted theories that Lorenzo was talking about a couple of days ago, uh, and many others. There's lots of different process theories that you could start thinking about from this perspective, too. So there's a few interesting open questions that I, I'd like to pursue in future research. The first is to explore in more detail how all of this relates to high-order processes um, and high-order process theories. So. We've got some very preliminary work on this, but uh, there's a lot more to be said here. There's also the question of, is any of this sort of physically relevant in any sense, or is this just a, a nice sort of mathematical toy to play with? Um, so in particular, this ties in with the idea of, could we find sort of experimental ways to adjudicate between sort of time symmetric versions of theories and the, the theories themselves? And finally, I think it'd be interesting to try and look at the constructions of quantum theory from this perspective to see if we can find uh, a set of postulates that reconstruct time symmetric quantum theory in one of these flavors uh, rather than the usual uh, quantum theory of CPTP maps. Okay, so with that, I'll finish and thank you for your attention. Carla Maria? Hmm? I think you need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thanks for the, for the talk. Thanks. I have actually a curiosity. So in the first uh, sort of proposal you mentioned, which is the first implementation of retro causality, I think, where actually you found uh, unital maps. Yeah. I find it quite uh, interesting that Unital maps are actually used as one of the proposed uh, operations to define a resource theory of thermodynamics. So, which is, you know, thermodynamics is clearly not time symmetric, right? Yeah. So, yeah. essentially, they arise here from a constraint where you wanted to build a theory as more time symmetric, but you find actually a set of maps that actually leads to thermodynamic behavior. So, I wanted to, to ask you if you have any idea or comment about that. Um. I've not thought about this at all, and I think it's a very interesting observation. Um, 
Yeah, I really don't think I've anything insightful to say there. So uh, uh, I'll have a think about it, though, and we should talk at some point. Maybe in this paper by Luthien, he's got some comments on this kind of thing. It wouldn't surprise me. Stefano, did you want to? Or should I go to? We're both Italian, so we're Okay. So in, in the third approach, when you use the kind of renormalization to... Uh, and so you solved the problem, you made it uh, kind of... Uh, you, you eliminate the kind of zero process by adding noise, essentially, right? Yeah. So, so I I believe that like would it be possible then to uh, use this kind of the amplification of this noise? I I think uh, like uh, this is something that that exists uh, to um, to kind of signal uh, faster than than light eventually. So to, uh, to 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 signal between space like separated events. Uh, using the amplification, non-linear amplification of probabilities. Uh, so, so my question is that, uh, like, doesn't then like the notion of a diagram in terms of a causal structure, uh, like, doesn't it cease, uh, cease to to be meaningful in a way? Yes, so right. you... I, I think um, you you don't even need to go to sort of this level um, to see that you start to hit this kind of issue. Um, Basically, e even without the noise, if, if we're in this sort of theory, uh, this is a compact uh, category, so we have cups and caps. And so, uh, and these are sort of proper uh, like operations in the theory. They're not sort of things that happen only with post-selection now. Um, so really, the, the distinction between inputs and outputs totally sort of breaks down in this kind of theory. And so, yeah, there's no real meaning to space-like separated versus uh, sort of uh, time-like separated. So if I have an entangled state, that's exactly the same in this theory as having sort of a channel. So yeah, uh, there's no real uh, constraint here that ensures that if you had a space-like separated thing, you don't have signaling. Okay, thank you. I, I think um, to... Uh, it, it, when, when this uh, sort of approach was proposed by um, Ereshkov and Surf, they talk about how you can sort of recover sort of the time uh, ordering that we see in the universe by sort of appropriately picking boundary conditions for um, your universe. And then when you have that, then it's sort of the boundary conditions that enforce no signaling rather than it being the fundamental theory itself. One more question from Heller. Hi, John. Thanks for the talk. Um, I've got one um, comment or, or question for you about a thought I had when you mentioned the first first um, construction you, ha you had. So if you impose retrocausality, uh, you said that in the end you only get one state, and that makes a very, a very bad theory. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering from the physical point of view, uh, perhaps perhaps this, this should be um, the... Fundament a, a more fundamental theory of, of physics than, than what we have now when we assume that we can always prepare any pure state we like, but we can't post-select on pure states. Because if you think what, what happens in the lab um, to make a pure state, uh, in, in photonics for example, you usually use um, so some device that creates uh, entangled photons and then you measure one of them and, uh, until you get uh, the state that you want and then you know the other ones in the state you want to do. And uh, if you want to get like a ground state of, of some fridge, you keep cooling it down and you figure out that there's a ground state when you've measured the temperature. So, so it seems like fundamentally, actually, operationally, we, as experimenters, we don't have access to pure states in the end. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts, like maybe, maybe what, what you've written down there is actually what we should be thinking of as a fundamental theory of physics. Yeah, I, th I think that... Um, I, I don't know whether necessarily you would want to stick to only one state, but definitely sort of restricting to you to only sort of noisy states is definitely a sensible thing. Like pure states, I think really are a bit of a fiction when you start to talk about to, well, if you start to talk to experimentalists, they you know, will never actually have a pure state in the lab. But also I kind of think that if you're trying to really do sort of fundamental physics with sort of process theories, then really states as a whole are something that is only really an effective notion in a theory. Like any any box that you have in your lab 
will always have some input to it, right? You, there'll be some causal past that is is relevant. Maybe unless you chase it back to the Big Bang or something, but at least nowadays, like there's always some sort of causal past to anything we're doing. So saying that we should have states at all maybe is something that uh, should be should be removed. And then having like we can think of this sort of discarding effect not as a physical thing, but just as sort of ignoring a system that we don't care about anymore. And maybe we, if we take that perspective, you can think of this uh, sort of uniform mixed state, not as a state, but as just sort of how we describe not caring about where the system came from. So yeah, I, I do think there is like, despite the fact I said this initially seemed like a stupid idea, uh, I, I think there is a lot to think about that could be uh, interesting here. Thanks. All right. Is there a final question? Okay, let's... Uh, what? Are you pointing somewhere? Okay, one more. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was a bit curious about the second construction you had, where you sort of added these uh, retrocausal systems. Uh, the first thing I was curious about is how the causal, how the kind of the upwards facing part and the downwards facing part interact. Uh, I mean, you seem to have cups and caps, but I don't know if you said anything else. Yes. Yeah, so, so was the, was the more of the question? Or should I cut you off? Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 how? So, so, so you, you, as I understand it, you kind of freely add these these uh, systems with a downwards pointing arrow. Um, so, so you add sort of retro causal A and retro causal B. Um, so, so it's not really a dagger anymore in the sense that it doesn't, it's not the identity on objects. Is, is that right, if I, if I understood? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Uh, and we um, uh, so, so what, what are the, um, uh, are, are there any sort of morphisms that, uh, that uh, have like a, both a causal system and a retro causal system in their source or in their target? Um, yeah. yeah, so basically what we have here is um if we uh if we're talking about quantum theory then we still can sort of describe both of these kinds of systems as quantum systems and then we can say let's imagine and so then it's really just a labeling the, the arrow is not doing anything sort of mathematically and we can say what's the space of cp map for these and then we restrict the cp maps that satisfy this equation here, so no signaling kind of constraint. And this sort of kills off cups and caps and so on. So it, this is quite restrictive. Um, but then I think what's an interesting question is to ask, is there some way we could do something like this uh, for sort of generic process theories? And so far, we only have like a very uh, trivial construction where we sort of have no interaction between these theories at all. But it would be interesting to try and see if we can do something that's a more general uh, for general process theories that still leads to interesting interactions.